evening. Welcome to the uh, Florida Publishing User Group. Uh, tonight, we're glad to have uh, our speaker from Nashville, Tim Warner. Uh, topic for tonight will be Mastering Your Agro Expressions in Windows PowerShell. Uh, it's going to be very entertaining watching him how he does his magic with PowerShell. As a reminder, uh, he's our sponsor for the user group. Uh, we totally support all our sponsors. So thank you very much for them, for their support. Uh, they have very excellent products. And make sure you go to Plosite Hardcore Developer Training. Uh, you get a lot of information uh, and training uh, that will suit your needs for either IT Pro developers of, of any uh, operating system. If you need to contact me, please go ahead and uh, here's my contact information. Write it down. Uh, I'm available 24-7 uh, and uh, hopefully I'll help you out in uh, your scripting solution. And with this, I'm going to pass the, uh, the mic to the, our, our friend. Mm -hmm. You can take it from here, Tim. All right. Thanks very much, Max. Yep. Let me get my desktop shared here, select the right monitor, present, and can you see the PowerPoint? It's loading, it's loading right now. Okay, let me know once it's up. There you go. Okay, good deal. Well, thanks again, Max, for having me, and thanks to all of you who are watching this presentation now. As Max said, my name's Tim Warner. I often tell people that if they think of Time Warner without the money, you'll never forget my name. <laughs> I'm an IT pro, a PowerShell enthusiast, and I work full time as a tech trainer for Pluralsight, one of the sponsors I noticed, as Max just said. So we're here to, to learn about regular expressions in PowerShell, and I'm going to keep the slides to a bare minimum here so we can get right into the meat and potatoes. But what I want to cover, the questions that are perhaps on your mind are, first of all, why should you care about reg regular expressions? You may have problems that really use regular expressions as a solution, and you just wonder where to begin. Or maybe you've copied and pasted regex recipes online, and you'd like to know a little bit about how and why it works. And that's exactly what I'm here to help you with. And I want to keep it as practical as possible. I've got uh, three or four very practical examples, and I'm going to show how we can combine Windows PowerShell with regular expressions to solve those problems. So make a note of this URL, if you would. I've taken this PowerPoint deck, the work files that we'll be working with, as well as the PowerShell script file, zipped it all up and put it on my website. So, And it's up there right now. So if you go to timwarnertech.com forward slash flpsug.zip, you can snag those resources, especially the PowerShell script file is going to be important for you. So in a nutshell, what kind of problems would we want to look at regular expressions to solve? A big one would be data validation, right? Maybe you just need to find specific string data, that is to say alphanumeric and or non-alphanumeric data in database tables and text files and log files. And you know, using the old command.exe star and question mark isn't going to get you very far if you're looking for specific formats. Think of how phone numbers are represented around the world. Think of email conventions, passwords, domain names, UNC paths, social security numbers. So we're thinking here about searching and finding data, string data, looking for very specific matches, not just words in a sentence where you're doing a static match. I need a customer named Jones. OK, show me all the Jones. No, how about customers who live, who have a particular area code? Well, maybe you could do that without regular expressions. I do want to say, just in the name of best practices, don't put blinders on when you're trying to solve a problem, finding, isolating text, extracting it. Sometimes regular expressions may be the best solution. Sometimes it's not. So I often recommend to avoid putting on the blinders, because I know as well as anybody being in industry, when solving a problem, especially when the heat's on, it's difficult sometimes to get out of that just 
there's one way to do it, and by gosh, I'm going to get it done even if I have to stay all night to do it. So we want to match data as precisely as possible. We want to exclude unwanted characters, and potentially we want to extract the data that we're looking to find. We may need to do data replacing, cleaning, formatting. All that stuff is possible that we can't do with the old MS-DOS commands. Again, very briefly, because I want to keep the theory to a minimum, what regular expressions means. It has an interesting history. You should go to Wikipedia at the least and read the article on it. A regular expression is a way to use syntax to describe text or string patterns. And as I said, we could be looking, for instance, for uh, localization issues, like realize has an S or a Z, depending upon where you are. You, make, you could write a regular expression to capture both of those cases in your source text. As you know, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses have specific rules beyond just three decimals, dot three decimals. I mean, you think about you can't have an IP address starting with 500. Web addresses, you could have HTTP or HTTPS. You, and the list goes on and on. You see what I'm saying? The father of regular expressions, there is actually a guy before Stephen Clean, but this American mathematician named Stephen Clean gets a lot of the credit for defining this regular set algebra. And algebra, of course, is a way to represent data generically. And that's kind of what we have with regular expressions. We're using meta characters rather than literal characters most of the time. I mean, you see those dates, 1956, 1968. Regular expression syntax has been part of Unix and Linux since the very beginning. To this very day, we can use regex with grep, for instance. Thus, underlying the most common standard, I would say, is defined as the Perl compatible regex, or PCRE. And now we're getting closer to Windows PowerShell. In fact, we've already talked about this. I'm going to go right past this, this um, slide. And nowadays, we have in PowerShell the .NET implementation of regex, which under the hood, the .NET framework regex comes from PCRE. So that'll become a little clearer once we get into the code when you're wondering, for instance, is this regex pattern that I'm using now or that I'm getting off the internet, is that going to work with Windows PowerShell or is that limited to another scripting language or programming language? This slide just shows some regex-ish tools. I first started to see the power of regular expressions using Microsoft Word of all tools, where I needed to search for non-printing characters, for instance, like to find all instances of two spaces instead of one. It's not regular expression syntax as such that Microsoft Office uses, unfortunately. But it at least got me interested in this notion of creating really accurate, like laser sharp searches to find exactly the data, the alphanumeric or non-alphanumeric data you need and leave behind anything you don't need. Modern day text editors, like my personal favorite, Sublime Text, when you're doing a find or replace, I've highlighted it in the slide, there's actually the capacity to use regular expressions to do your searches and replaces. So in other words, investing in understanding regular expressions is going to help you really in any area of IT, from infrastructure and IT ops to development and beyond. Why we're doing this in PowerShell? We don't have to. We could just concentrate on regular expressions in itself. But of course, the general audience, there's Jeffrey Snover there, is the IT pro and not necessarily the programmer, right? So we're looking at PowerShell as a vehicle for performing really precise string find and replaces. And as I've said, the underlying regex engine in PowerShell comes directly from the .NET framework. So with that, let me dump out of the slides and let's bring up the PowerShell ISE and get to work here. So as I said, this script file has a lot of goodies in it, so make sure to download. I'll put up that link again at the end of the presentation. In fact, I'll edit this piece right here. It's flpsug.zip. There's that. Let me save my change here. But anyway, at the head of the file here, I have a section called Useful Resources. And if I were to just summarize my favorite 
of different categories like online testers, offline testers, tutorials. I've looked at just about every regex tutorial that's on the internet and that's my favorite one. It's perfectly free and that always helps. We may revisit some of these links in a little bit but these should give you a really nice head start if you're not already aware of them, especially with the testing. This rubular is really useful for just quickly testing your regular expressions to make sure they're catching what you want them to catch. Okay, another preliminary point. I find a lot of PowerShell users, even those who are quite experienced, don't know about conceptual help. You know about get help, but there's a whole library of about underscore files that give you help regarding the concept rather than a specific command. So the three that are pertinent to regular expressions are about comparison operators, about regular expressions, and uh, select string, which of course is a separate commandlet. And if you're wondering why I hit run and it's just hanging, I think this is a bug. I submitted it to Bruce Payette and he accepted it, but I found that in PowerShell v5 production preview, it takes like 45 seconds to load a help file from the ISE. It's really weird, but anyway, moving on. I have a whole section here where we can get some practice getting into the syntax, because that's probably why you're watching here. You want to know what all these wacky meta characters mean, okay? So first, let's take a look at something that's probably familiar to you. Get command noun help, star help star. We know that in the old batch command syntax, a star represents zero or one occurrences, and it could be one character or it could be a hundred characters. And as we see the results, sometimes it's some data before the help, sometimes it's data after the help, depending upon what it is. Yeah, like here's an example. I'm running ISE steroids here, so there's a a uh, commandlet called enable steroids help about cash. But you're probably familiar with that. In the same way, this example here, getting the child item, which is like a doing a dir of my D sample data folder. If I want to see Excel files that have both XLS or XLSX is the extension, I could use the old DOS star dot XLS question mark, where the question mark represents a single character, zero or one occurrences of a single character. So that's probably what most people are used to in Windows administration. Those of you who have already gone into the deep waters of Linux and Unix are probably old hats at reg regular expressions and may not even be watching this because of it. <laughs> but at any rate, let's get into it here. One place where we can use regular expression syntax in PowerShell is in the match operator. So you know you have the um, the equals, the greater than, all of those comparison operators that evaluate to Boolean true or false. Well, there's a few that are for regular expressions. Namely, there's match, which is a case insensitive regex match, and there's cmatch, which is case sensitive. So in this pipeline here, we're going to look at all commands on my system, but I'm going to filter it such that the name of each command matches this pattern. And we put our registry, our regex, excuse me, pattern between quotes. And you note that I'm using single quotes and not double quotes. If I had you here in front of me, I would ask you, as a good instructor would, why aren't I using double quotes and what's the difference? Well, I'll answer that. <laughs> Max, you could answer, of course. But um, double quotes, you might know, are used when you want to expand variables that are within the quoted string. It's best practice in PowerShell to use single quotes, generally speaking. So that's what I'm doing here. If you've done Linux and Unix regexes, you're used to putting them between forward slashes. But here in PowerShell, note to self, it's quotes. And what we're doing in this example is the same thing as star help star. The dot star in regular expressions is basically like the old DOS star. The dot in regex stands for any single character. So it really is directly analogous to the question mark. And the star in regex is an iterator that says zero or one occurrences of the previous character. That's something that takes some getting used to. When you're doing regex, when you're building regex expressions, you're going from left to right one character at a time. 
So you're going to be there's going to be various little syntax goodies that I have to show you that allow you to customize how many repetitions you want. Dot star is an infinite repetition. So we're saying anything and then static help and then dot star again, so anything. So that should give us the same result that we saw earlier with that um, with that get command. Let's test that by hitting F8. Sure enough, it gives us the same result. Similarly, remember I did the star dot XLS star. We could do the same thing. Admittedly, it's more verbose. I know some of you are thinking, well, why would I mess with this? But you know that we can use short aliases. We could say GCI. We don't have to say path here. I'm just kind of a purist. And Max, you and I were talking before we started recording that you like readable code. Well, so do I. And that absolutely means spelling out every commandlet, spelling out every named parameter, or even positional parameter for that matter. But anyway, in the where object clause here, we're doing basically the same thing. We're saying anything. And then you notice that I've got this wacky backslash before the dot. This is an escape character. And so what we're saying here is instead of the dot meaning any character in that position, we want, regist we want the regex engine to interpret the dot literally. So there'll be cases where you're going to need to escape a particular character. Like when you're doing universal naming convention paths, that's a good example. So if you had like server1 backslash share slash doc dot text, you can run comparisons interactively just like I'm doing here from the console or in the ISE. And then in quotes, put in your match. So if I was looking to match the first part, let's say whack whack server1, I'm not going to get anywhere just doing this. Let me evaluate that. Oh, it did come back. Oh, well, I, I know what happened here. Um, the first backslash is considered an escape character. So we're looking for a literal backslash, then we're looking for literal server one. So hopefully that would make sense to you why that would evaluate to true. I kind of got hoisted by my own petard here. But if I throw in an extra backslash, that should evaluate to false. So long story short, when you've got um, strange characters, in other words, characters you want to include in the regex evaluation, you have to escape them. So what that means at the end of the day is that you're going to wind up with four backslashes when you're escaping a literal whack whack in a UNC path, you see. So this match should and does come back true. And so what we have here is that we're saying anything literal dot, literal XL, and then any particular character. So that would match XLS. And actually, this would not match XLSX, wouldn't it? We would have to do something like that. So as you see, another trend that I've noticed with regular expressions is that it's not all wacky characters. If you go online and you look at some reg regex databases, you see these super hunk and long cryptic things. But it's not necessarily like that. As long as you there are, in fact, static string data that you need to match literally, there's no shame and no harm in including that in your evaluation. Okay. Now, I don't think it's necessary to go through every one of these examples. I borrowed these from my boss, mentor, and friend, Don Jones. And he's got a lot of goodies here. Maybe we'll go back to them. But I want to get to some practical examples, like, like I said at the beginning. This here is some pretty nasty looking code. It just performs a very simple test in terms of validating an email address. So let's say our corporate standard was first name dot last name at contoso.com. So in our code, we can store the test string. I'm just doing a static variable here. But you know, you could take this to nth level of automation, depending on your experience. And I'm also. Uh, storing the regular expression's expression, so to speak, in a string. I'm just going to change this to single quotes just because it's driving me nuts. And again, at first blush, you think to yourself, OK, Tim, I understand the escaping business. So I can see that we're looking for a, a literal dot. And so this business over here must somehow map to the first name. And this business over here must somehow map to the back to the last name. 
and then it looks like we're doing a literal match on at contoso.com. But of course, that leaves some questions. Notably, what the heck is this caret doing at the front? What is this dollar sign doing at the back? Those are what are called anchor characters. So I've used the term meta expression or meta character a lot. What we're seeing here is really an algebra where we're using these symbols to represent non-literality. I know I'm getting real. I'm starting to get metaphysical, Max. I think it's the time of day. <laughs> but um, th what this guy is saying, this caret, is look only at the front of each line. So if you were parsing a log file and you knew what you were looking at was at the very beginning of the line, well, you can anchor your expression by using the caret. Alternatively, if you're looking at a CSV file, for instance, and you're looking only in the rightmost column, then the dollar sign will anchor your expression to the end of each line. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of these meta characters that cover just about any use case you can think of. This is a neat little shortcut cheat sheet that is in one of the references I give on the script file. It's from regex1.com, my favorite tutorial site. And I love this because it very succinctly gives us the, um, the main meta characters that are going to come into play the majority of times when we write these match expressions. So we can see it has the um, star and the dot, which we already talked about. It talks about the escape character. And then the anchors, does it have those? Yep. Um, no, it, I'm not seeing it here. The dollars, oh, here it is right here, starts and ends. So everything you're learning is going to be redundantly stored in the script file or a reference. Because I know, I'm a teacher as well as a student, that you're going to want to come back and circle back and not have to sit through a 55-minute presentation. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. It's OK that we're anchoring this regex match because all we're dealing with is, is this single string. What's this business here? This is a range operator, or a range construction. When we have square brackets, we can do ranges. And it's depending upon your case, whether the regex engine is case sensitive or case insensitive. Normally, in the open source world, you always default to case sensitive. Of course, Windows has historically been case insensitive. So what we're saying is, go to the start of the line, or start of the string, and then is the next character, not the next series of characters, but is the next character A through Z? Yes, it is. So the match is going to go on. That's how the regex engine works. It moves a character at a time. It's seemingly really slow, but in actuality, it happens blindingly fast. This plus is an iterator that says, I'm looking for one or more instances of the previous character. So we're going to hit A through Z once. We're going to hit it again. We're going to hit it a third time. And then, whoops, that's not A through Z. So our match is going to be limited to just Tim at this point. Okay. So we're using the escape character to escape the dot. So at this point, we should be matching through here. Now to get the last name, again, we're going to take A through Z and then use plus to iterate it one or more times until it hits, yes, the rest of this. So again, this is a simple example, but I'm trying to wade us in deeper and deeper, all right? And then we have a simple if evaluation that says if the test email does not match. Remember, I mentioned that there's match for a case insensitive match, C match for a case sensitive match, and then there's not as well. In fact, let me bring out the list of those. Let me um, repeat that. There we go. So let's come down here. Uh, there's C match. There's I match, which I think we'll have to read the help. Again, about comparison operators is what you want to look for that. But anyway, we want match. If it, or was it not match? I'm sorry. Not match. Then what happens? Then we clear the host and we error out. Otherwise, there's more code here that I'm missing. Um, I think I accidentally nuked it. Let's see. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I'm getting myself I, all bollocked up here. Yikes. 
Okay, so if the male does not match regex, there's the error condition. Otherwise, we assume that it's a valid email address and we clear the host. I don't know why I have an extra host there. And then we write out test mail as a valid e email address. So again, just a simple example. So this should come back correctly. And if we change the email address to violate the rules, we should have the screen bleed red as PowerShell MVP Jason Helmick often says. All right, let's get into the examples here. I'm going to collapse all of my regions. And let's see, the first example is extracting IP addresses from trace route output. So what do we have here? First, I'm using the PSISE object just to load a text file from my C drive. What I did is I ran a trace route to um, a website, doesn't matter what it is, and I redirected the output into a text file. So this is what we have. And notice that we have uh, IPv4 addresses spread throughout the file. Again, it's a simple example, but it's the underlying points that we're looking at. I'm going to create a variable to hold the path for the input file as well as for the output file because my goal here is I want to strip all of the, the um, IPv4 addresses out of this file. We don't want to do it manually. I could do this manually, but if this had 2,000 IP addresses, I wouldn't put that task on the newest intern or my worst enemy or my in-laws or anybody. We're going to use PowerShell automation here. So now that we know that, we're going to store the results in a file that I'm going to call extractedipaddresses.txt. The toughest part is figuring out, A, what regular expression query we want to use, and B, will match work exactly what will our pipeline look like. So let's tackle that problem one at a time. First, I'm creating a variable to store the regular expression's expression. And what do we have here that's new? We have B, which is a meta character that stands for a word boundary. If you have data that's not anchored to the front or end of the line, but is instead kind of floating in the middle and maybe in a delimited text format file, then B is a good thing to bumper your regex with because it provides just that, word boundaries. So we're going to be able to capture this expression regardless of where it is in the line. Now, yes, if you've done registry, if registry, I keep saying registry, if you've done regexes for IPv4, you're probably thinking, Tim, this isn't catching like invalid IPv4 addresses, and that's true. I would say, easy, young Padawan. <laughs> As MVP Adam Bertram says, once you start catching those edge cases, you know you're getting a good regex expression because it becomes super, super long. That's what he told me once. He says, I know I've got a good regex expression when it goes on for like 100 characters. But what this is doing is bringing to the table another meta character, backslash D. B, we could look at as boundary, easy to remember. D is decimal, see? And if we just do backslash D, that represents one place. That would catch one number in the IPv4 address. But what we're looking instead for is between one and three instances of a decimal. And again, I know some people are thinking, well, is that a valid IP? Technically, that is, come to think of it. But by putting this in curly braces, not square brackets. Remember, the square brackets is to catch, like, um, a through Z, well, there's a few different things you can do with square brackets. With curly braces, you're instead looking at iteration. In other words, we're saying, I want to see between one and three instances of a decimal. And that should make sense, because that first octet could be 1, it could be 11, or it could be 111, you see? And as you know, we need to escape the dots. So you'll see we have backslash dot separating each one of these sections. And again, this is super, super simple here. If you want to um, get a real world, really accurate one, you can turn to a trusted source on the internet, for instance. Like, um, let me move this guy out of the way here. Um, let's see. I'm looking for regexlib. You may be familiar with this. regexlib.com is a really nice community library. 
and it's based on the .NET implementation of regex. So you don't have to worry about the few cases where regex may not work in um, PowerShell or .NET because it was intended for another platform. But we could do a keyword search here for, say, IP address, and then start to refine our results here. Let's see, would it be one of these? I'm just going to keep the category at all. But look, because it's a community site, we could filter to say, just show me, say, the 10 best community results from the user base. And as Adam said, you see these incredibly long regexes. And the longer they are, the more sophisticated they are in terms of catching, making sure that you're fully validating whatever it is that you're looking at. So in this second example, for instance, it says this regular expression validates within the range 1.000 to 255, 255, 255. And some of these may be written better than others. You'll find that if you spend enough time horsing around with regex, there is a degree of performance tuning and optimization in writing these. You may be able to be more terse than one of these authors. You see what I mean? But technically, we could copy this right out of here. In fact, there's an online tester built right into regexlib. And like I said, it defaults to the .NET engine case insensitive where you can put your, um, you can load an external data source or you could just hand code it in here and then test the regular expression. So I'll do 192.168.254 and submit. And let's see, it gives you your match results down below. Now if you're wondering what the dollar business is, well, I'll get back to that in just a minute. But Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled programming, marching on. I know this is a heck of a lot of information to throw at you, and I'm staying at level 100. It's crazy. The commandlet to know with, with PowerShell and regular expressions is select string. This guy is your friend when it comes to dipping into potentially huge text files. Now, you can use the regex type accelerator as well if you know what type accelerators are. It's a more direct way to access the underlying .NET framework. But let's stick with select string here, where we're taking our input file as a path, and then the pattern parameters where you substitute your regex. And I'm just substituting the variables to make the code a little bit easier to read. Now, this is a gotcha here. Make sure when you're doing select string, in most cases, you're going to want to gather all matches, are we right? If you leave that switch off, it's only going to select string is only going to stop at the first match it finds in your data source. So make sure to do that. In fact, let me just take this part. Actually, how much of this have I loaded into memory? I'm not sure. So I'm going to get these three variables loaded into my run space. And then let's just select this part and run it and see what comes back. So it looks like at this point, uh, it's, it's ingested that initial file. And it's found matches, line matches, that contain the results. But it's not trimming out just the data we need. So we're going to have to definitely go beyond just select string and do some kind of iteration. And I know at first blush you think, oh, yeah, 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 this is kind of a long pipeline. But it really gets the job done pretty well. What it's doing here is that it's iterating through the results. It's going through two loops, two for loops, one right after the other. The first, where it's pulling out only the strict, the, the matches, which are what you see here. And then the second loop through, we're going to pull out only the values, the dots. First of all, in case you don't know, the dollar sign and the underscore is a shorthand way to represent each object that's coming in from the previous segment in the pipeline. And then what's coming after the dot here is a property that's part of that object, right? So one of the great beauties of PowerShell is that instead of just parsing raw text and keeping it as flat text, we can actually do something with that data. It's a beautiful thing. We've got these three-dimensional objects. So if I stop at the second part of the pipeline and just grab the matches, you can see that we've now successfully pulled out the IP address. But we just want, we don't want group success captures. We don't need all this metadata. In our end result, we just want the value property, which gives us 
the raw data. So that's what's happening in this section here. We make another pass through grabbing the value property. And even that is just going to keep the data in our run space. Let me do an F8 to hit that. You see, so that's looking good, but that's just standard out on our screen. If we want to reconstitute the results in a file, we can do it any number of ways. But a simple way is to do out file. And then I'm passing in the path that I created in the output file variable. So end of the story, let's just place our cursor in line 99, run it. And then let's load that result file into a new tab in the ISE. So there you have it. So what you do from here is completely up to you. But our mission is accomplished at this point. OK? All right. Next, we have parsing an IIS log file. Let's say that we're migrating. We're in the process of migrating our intranet website. And we want to find dead end pages sooner rather than later. So we want to parse through potentially humongoid IIS log files looking for HTTP 404 errors. So first, let's just load in the file into our run space. I have a sample file here. It should look familiar if you've looked at the IIS log files. It's a delimited file. Looks like it's kind of space delimited. It's got fields. Each field has a really terse name. But you've got these three junk lines that we're not going to need here that are just comments and metadata. In fact, I submit that if we're going to do anything with this data programmatically, like searching it for 404 errors, we're going to need to get rid of this junk. And we're going to want to try to make objects out of this data. So we've got every column associated with its column header. That should be a lot easier then. Uh, because as it happens, I believe it's the SC status field that's going to give us our HTTP code. OK, so there's our source data. Looks pretty gnarly. Let's create two variables, one for the input path, CIIS log. The other is storing the path of our extraction file. We're going to have a file at the end of this process that contains only the pages that are 404-ing or dead-ending. In order to constitute the file, bring it in and create a proper CSV from it, one approach is to run a get content, just to bring the file into our run space. And again, if I had you here face to face, what I would say is, why am I breaking at the pipe? You notice that in order to make this code easier to read, I'm putting it on multiple lines. And I'm breaking it specifically at the pipe. And if I were to put a space after the pipe, I dare say it's going to crash. It's not going to work. Again, just a little PowerShell best practice tidbit. The two ways to break a line are to use the backtick character, which is above the tab, or the pipe. But you can't have anything after that character. And one thing among many that makes ISE steroids so useful is, as you can see here, you may be able to see it in your screen, maybe not. You can see the space characters. That's an excellent, quick sanity check debug. So anyway, we're grabbing the content. We're bringing it in. And then look here. Select objects, skip three. That means skip those first three rows. So we're able to completely bypass those comments. That's pretty slick, isn't it? So at that point, we should just have the data. In fact, let's select it and run it. Uh, what didn't it like there? An empty pipe. It didn't like the pipe. So let's just select everything but the pipe. And I'm going to Control C because there's a lot of data in that file. But if we scrolled up to the very beginning, uh, let's see, can I get to the beginning? Did my buffer give me enough room? We'll see. It looks like it did. We're able to. Oh, come on, Tim. Come on. There we go. So it starts at the proper row, but we still have a bit of cruft or garbage left over. First 10. There you go, Max. Thanks for that tip. Absolutely. Yeah, so what Max is saying, if you're not familiar, is that the select object parameter, if you just want to see a little bit of the output, we can throw in first. Very good idea. Instead of having to worry about scrolling, and basically what I just did. <laughs> OK. Next, what are we doing in this particular solution? Running a for each. We're doing an iterator. We're basically, in this um, little expression here, 
we're using Replace. And Replace is actually a good tool for you to have in your toolkit besides Match. It's often used with Match because Replace allows you to do a search on regular expressions in addition to static matches. And basically, when you're doing a replace, a string replace, you're, this is your search query, comma, and then this is what you're replacing it with. So we're just looking for that little bit of junk at the first line, and we're replacing it with nothing. So this is just some data cleanup that we're doing right here. Next, we're doing a convert from CSV with a delimiter space. This is to give us proper CSV output. Let's um, come back ah, and do a, just to here, just take a quick look. That looks better, doesn't it? By the time we run convert from CSV, let me bring the split bar up a little bit, we have proper objects. And we notice that the data in each row is nicely associated key value pairs between the column name and the column data. So this is going to be much cleaner now as we're going in and drilling in. And notice that we don't even need regular expressions. That's really another theme of this particular example that although you can, if you really want to, invoke reg regular expressions, in this case, the solution doesn't actually require it. Instead, it requires us to just create objects instead of raw text and do some data cleansing. And then we just filter using a simple where object here, where SC status equals 404. Isn't that cool? And in this case, we want our out file to only contain that property, CSI URI stem, where the SC status is 404. It's going to load it into an out file. And then this line here, 114, will put the out file into a new ISE tab. That's pretty slick, isn't it? And we didn't even have to use regex, kind of anticlimactic in a way. And I know I don't have to reselect those um, variables, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Now, of course, it's only giving us the results that come from the first 10 or whatever it is that I had in the list. This would be a much more robust list if I had it go after the entire file. But you get the idea, I hope. Let's get to a, another example that involves some regular expressions as our final example tonight. Redacting social security numbers for a file. So in this case, let's bring in my source file. It's called customers.csv. And let's see, yeah, that was just the um, variable. Let me bring both of these variables into our run space and add the source file to a tab so we can take a quick look at it. This, maybe this is an export from a database. You know, you can always extract table data from SQL Server or any RDBMS is CSV. And it's a huge file again. There's thousands of records. And I kind of hacked it a little bit and made the last column social security number. The source, and this is all dummy data, by the way. Nothing of this is real. I changed it to social security number, and I changed what used to be phone numbers into fake social security numbers. Yeah, Walmart, this is actually, yeah, this is a leak file from the last big data leak. I think it was Target. Just kidding, although I should never kid about that because it's devastating. But anyway, we have as our last column these fake social security numbers. Let's say that our department's being audited for FIPS compliance or PCI compliance, and we're really scared that we may be exposing personally identifiable information in the clear. So we not only need to identify that data in our source, but we need to create a report of it. But we want to redact this so we're not actually exposing anything sensitive to whoever we are consultant or whoever we're working with. So in this example, we're going to import the CSV natively, specifying tab as the delimiter. And this is an argument I have with the PowerShell team. Their help files have fallen out of date. For instance, if you look at the help for import CSV, they don't tell you the allowed delimiters. I had to do quite a bit of research <laughs> to learn that it's backtick T for tabs. But if we do this, I think I've loaded these other guys into the run space, but let's create the source CSV variable. And then if we echo it, I know I could do a 
select um, five here, but I'm just going to control break it. Again, when we're using objects in PowerShell with CSV, it's so beautiful. We've got such a nice lineup here between our properties and our values. In this case, we're looking for the social security number field, aren't we? So we're going to do a for each loop going through each element in the pipeline, but we're not doing dot something. We're instead going to invoke replace, this time using our handy dandy regular expression instead of a non regex expression. Again, the simple example, but you know by now that backslash D is digit. And when we have curly braces, this is an iterator that if we wanted exactly three instances of a previous digit, that's what D3 does. If we want only exactly two digits, it's two. And for the last part of the SSN, it's four. And yes, if you go to regexlib.com, there are some really wonderful regex patterns that include the rules. Because, you know, in the US, there are specific rules that govern what a valid SSN is. But in this case, we're just looking for that general pattern, and then we're going to replace it with all X's, create an out file, and I'm going to clobber the file if it already exists on the, in my file system. That's perfectly OK. And then I'm going to bring the result file into a tab, as we saw before. So let's run this. Wait, keep your fingers crossed, and there we go. Now notice that we have hash table results here. We, we have some additional work to do if we want an actual CSV file or HTML file or text file, but that's trivial. We've done the major work here. We have the social security numbers masked and um, problem solved, I guess, long story short. To wrap up, let me collapse all the elements here in this file and bring back my Firefox browser. It's hard to get to these tabs here because of the presentation control. Let me try to get that out of the way. I wanted to just very quickly show you some of the most helpful sites that I like. Rubular.com, PowerShell MVP Jeff Hicks especially liked this when I showed this to him several months ago. Yes, it uses the Ruby, which I think uses PCRE as its underlying engine, but I found for my cases it works just fine with .NET regex. You can put your string data that you're looking for, again, whether it's a UNC path or whatever. And then as you test, um, the results and the matches immediately show up. One final meta character I want to show you is backslash W. Backslash W denotes uh, an alphanumeric character. And so when you do backslash W plus, remember plus is an iterator that means one or more instances of the previous character. If we escape the whack whack in the UNC path and then do a backslash W, I know it's a lot of backslashes. This is going to capture just the first part of the, um, of the path. Now notice that I put that in parentheses. Because we're running short on time, I'm trying to pack as much value as possible into this. A beautiful thing that I love so much about regular expressions is the ability to create what are called capture groups. You may have in your source data a list of a bunch of UNCs, and you only want to capture some of the match, some of the results. Long story short, use parentheses. Just like you use parentheses in arithmetic, you can use parentheses in your regular expression syntax to do grouping or capture groups. I'm losing my cursor here in Rubular for some reason. It's not working. So let me come back to the code, because I have an example of this with universal naming convention names in the, in the simple tests part of the file. Let me see if I can quickly find it. I think it's down towards the bottom. Yeah, right here, this guy right here, 79. What are we doing? We have a UNC, a full one. And let's say we only need to see share, the middle part, the share name. We can write a relatively simple pattern. And although it, before tonight, I hope it probably looked like gibberish, but I hope now it makes sense that, oh, yeah, we're looking for the literal whack whack. We're looking for one or more alphanumerics that would take in the server name. We're going to escape the backslash because we want to 
literally capture this guy. Another backslash W plus would normally take care of this. We're going to escape the second, the final backslash, and then W plus. So that is going to capture the whole dadgum um, URL. And the reason why that's so, we can prove that by running it. And you'll notice that we can see down below the matches. I didn't mention this earlier. I probably should have, but better late than never. When you do a regex match in PowerShell, the most recent match is stored in memory in an automatic variable called dollar matches. So a nice sanity check, actually, is to look at the contents of the matches variable. Now let me, um, I'm going to get back to capture groups in just a second, but let me take away the parentheses and just do the original one. Let's um, run it. It'll come back as true, and then let's echo matches, and it tells us what was matched. So it's kind of, it's not as clean as that Rubular. I mean, Rubular gives you instant feedback exactly what's matched. Here, you get a true or false, and then you optionally can look at matches. But what's neat about matches, you notice that says name zero. It's an indexed array of results. So for instance, we can use parentheses around part of the regular expression, and that's going to be a separate capture group. So let's run that again. It's true. Dollar sign matches, and check that out. So now we have index 0 is the full path. Index 1 is share. And we can programmatically work with just that little bit by using the good old dot notation. Um, actually, I believe we just use index notation. So it would be matches square brackets 1 to grab just that bit of data. Isn't that awesome? So when you think of that and then combining it with the pipeline and with for loops where you're iterating through multiple matches, you can gather specific parts of a regex match and then do whatever the heck you need to do depending upon your business requirements. So I can't overstate how powerful the parentheses are when you're doing capture groups. Let's see, some other random stuff sweeping up the shavings here. Here's another example of using the square brackets. You might want to capture just specific letters. So in this case, I want to look for literally J, then either A, E, I, or U, not and, it's or, and then literal FF. So in this case, this should come back as false, actually. So why, why is that the case? Because we're matching first statically on the J. And remember that regex works a character at a time. So the next character is, in fact, in this range. But look, the next character needs to be an F in order for this to be a match. So if we try it now, that's still coming back false. What am I missing here? Oh, we're looking for FF, aren't we? So. There you go. This, whoops, what did I do here? Control Z. This should come back true. There we go. OK, so a lot of um, experimentation. There's, there's other stuff, other goodies in that file. I definitely want to bring back this. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. This is actually, I extracted this from regex1.com. I'm going to add this to the zip file, because it's currently not in the zip. But as soon as we end the session, I'll add it to the zip file and put it on my web server. Because like I said, this is an excellent Cliff Notes. And now that you understand the basic syntax, you should be able to figure out on your own, like backslash w is, well, we already covered that. But backslash uppercase w captures non-alphanumerics. That, I think, is a little different with regex compared to non-regex. If you're looking for white space, backslash s, that's useful. Um, alternations, where you're looking for this or that or the other, there you use parentheses. So in this example, can I zoom that in a little bit? I guess so. This would match a, b, c, or d, e, f. That can be awfully useful if you're looking for if you have share names or URLs or subdomains that might be one of X number of possibilities, you can make cut down on your matching by using alternations.
So, so there you have it. I appreciate you joining very much. Let me bring up the closing slide that has my contact info and that URL and so on. At least it used to. It's <laughs> Um, that's weird. I'll just add it statically to, oh, here it is. It's timwarnertech.com forward slash FLP SUG. And questions, comments, concerns, curiosities, that's my personal email address. On Twitter, I'm Tech Trainer Tim, T E C H Trainer T I M. And I look forward to interacting with you in the future. Happy PowerShelling and thanks again. Hey, Tim, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very good. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, Max. It was really great to be a part of this tonight. Awesome, awesome. Really appreciate it, man. Uh, video's going to be out soon, so mm -hmm. we're going to try to process it tonight. Uh, hopefully, okay. between now and the weekend, I'll have it out, okay? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Hold on a second. Let me uh, stop the recording.